how many of you have ever failed a test before? Anybody? Yeah, wow. So uh, I did once, and it was a big one. Uh, this particular test would determine whether or not I would graduate with the rest of my class in high school. It was my senior year. It was the final class. It was the final test, and I... I, uh, I was struggling and I was sweating bullets, to be honest with you. The class was world history. Now, at that time in my life, world history was probably the most boring thing that I had ever encountered in my life. Now, there was another guy in the class with me. Uh, he was, uh, I called him Big James. Uh, he was several years behind me. I, if I remember right, he was a freshman. And uh, he was struggling probably as much as I was, or maybe even a little more, to be honest with you. And somehow we became buddies, and, and I did everything that I could to encourage him. He had somewhat of a, a learning disability, just had a real hard time retaining this information. And, and I would work with him, and it was kind of like the blind leading the blind, to be honest with you. And, and, uh, but we, we, we kind of did it. But anyway, on the day of the, the final exam, I took the test. I uh, walked up to the class or up to the teacher. I laid it on his desk and I went back and I sat down waiting for him to grade it. And uh, as I'm sitting there, you know, I'm watching him look over. He had the famous red pen. Everybody remember the red pen? Why is it that teachers always red, use red pens? Can't they use some other color? Anyway, so he finishes and he nods at me. And so I walk back up to the desk. And as I walk up to the desk, he he slides the piece of paper across the desk, and, and I hesitantly hesitate to, to look down. And when I did, across the top was a big fat F. And immediately I knew all these things were going through my head. It's like, oh, no, this means I'm not going to graduate. This means i got to go to summer school. This means I'm not going to graduate with all of my friends. And, and I just remember sitting, all these things were running through my mind, and, and I remember thinking, I don't know what was going to be worse, uh, having to go to summer school or having to sit through world history all over again. And, uh, but um, as I'm standing there, and, and I know all the color had left my face because, all, I mean, I just couldn't, you know, everything had boiled down to this final test. All I needed was a D to pass and to graduate. And as I'm standing there, he takes and he pulls the paper back across uh, the desk. He marks out the F. He puts a D on it and slides it back across to me. And I'm kind of standing there looking at him. And he says, this is for all the help that you gave James this year. And he shook my hand and he said, congratulations. And I went and I sat back down at, the, uh, at my desk, really speechless. Now, why do I share that with you? One, because I hate to fail at anything. I just, I hate it with a passion. But it also reminds me of an interesting verse in scripture that says this. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you what? You fail the test. Now, when it comes to failing tests, this is the one that uh, obviously I would say would be the worst that any of us could obviously fail. Today, we're picking up uh, where we left off last week. If you weren't here last week, that's okay. I can catch you up real quick. Uh, we're in a series of, of conversations where we're talking about what it looks like to follow. And specifically, we're talking about what it looks like and what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, there are a lot of people who identify themselves today as Christians, but it's amazing in this large number of group of people who refer to themselves or identify themselves as Christians, very few of that same number of people identify themselves as a follower of Jesus Christ, which is really an oxymoron, especially if you understand what it, you know, the definition of Christian. The word Christian in the, the original meant to be Christ-like, but yet a lot of people say, well, I'm Christian, but they don't identify themselves as being a follower of Jesus Christ. Our culture today is obsessed with having followers. Uh, and, and I shared this a couple weeks ago. It's true of all ages. I, even our elementary age students have social media pages where they're, they're trying to get as many followers as they possibly can. And of course, us as adults, we're doing the exact same thing. And we've even gotten creative when it comes to creating followers. We've learned how to 
trick people into becoming followers of ours, especially on social media. Uh, we know we, there, there are ways to entice them into it. There are ways to, to guilt people into it. Did you know that you can actually buy fake followers in order to gain real followers? Now, how sick is that, that we have to buy fake followers in order to get real followers to follow us? It's just crazy how far this has come. My question, though, is this. What if, what if we were as obsessed with following as we are with being followed, especially when it comes to following Jesus Christ? So we're creating this list, a list of traits that, uh, that define what a follower of Jesus Christ looks like. And I'm not talking, again, about what it looks like or what it means to be a Christian, because in, in t- this culture today, that just has a, it's really just lost so much of its meaning. And so what I'm really talking about is what does it look like, you know, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? And so we're creating this list uh, that I've said that I, I think we can use this list to examine or, or, as this verse says, to test ourselves to see if we really are followers of Jesus Christ or not. And so far, our list looks like this. We've said followers believe, and by by believe, we we don't mean that there's just this mental consent, which is what a lot of people would, uh, I think, define a Christian to mean. But we're talking about someone who who not just believes, but has relied upon, is fully trusting in the, the, the work of Jesus Christ, everything that he did, everything that he said, all the promises that he made. I mean, we've bought into it. We're really leaning into those things. We said followers love, and not just by, w- with word of mouth, but by the very actions, the very way that we lead our, live our lives. And not only do we love God, but we love God by the way we love others, our neighbors. We talked about that. Last week, we talked about followers obey, that it is better for us to obey than to have to ask God for forgiveness. Remember the verse we talked about? It's better to obey than to sacrifice. In other words, it's better to do the right thing up front than than falling back on God's grace and go, okay, I'm sorry, God, forgive me for that. And we use that as an excuse. True followers don't do that, all right? And so today, we're adding to our list. The next one is Followers pray and listen. And since followers pray and listen, let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Would you pray with me? Father, today, I simply ask, God, that as we look at this list, that we would pause for a moment to, to examine ourselves and to test ourselves, to see how we're doing when it comes to our faith, when it comes to our fellowship of you. And so, Father, today as we look at this idea of followers pray and listen, I God, we, we, first of all, we, we pause to pray, to give you thanks for being the good God that you are. And then, Lord, I would simply ask that you would teach us to become better listeners. And, Lord, I pray and ask this in Christ's name. And we all agree together and said? So we all know and appreciate the benefits of praying. We know verses like this one. Philippians 4, uh, 6 and 7, it says, do not be anxious. Everybody say anxious. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by what? By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And as we do that, look what happens. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we get it. We understand. We know that we have this incredible privilege to go before God when we're anxious, when things are are just weighing on us, whatever it is, that any time we can stop and we can pray to God. And as we learn to really pray, we give that anxious stuff over to God. And in place of that, what do we get? We get God's incredible peace. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. It, it transcends all understanding. Meaning, I, you know, I, I know I was anxious just a few minutes ago, but simply after praying, all of a sudden I'm just filled with this peace. And so we get that. We understand that. I, think, I don't think praying is the problem, though. I think listening is where we as followers of Christ struggle the most. And so today, that's the part that I want to focus on as we uh, have this conversation. And so let me ask you a couple of questions to kind of get you thinking. The first question is this. Have you ever heard God speak? Have you ever heard God speak? If you have, 
Uh, what did it sound like? Was it audible? I mean, did you actually hear a voice? Was it more like a, a prompting? Uh, then, then how did you know that it was God? And then my last question is this, can we really know when it's God speaking to us? Anybody struggle with any of those kind of questions besides me? I think we all do, don't we? We, we, we often wonder, okay, can I hear God? And, and if I could, what would it sound like? And, and we go through all that, and, and, and can we even know if it's God or not? You know, to be honest with you, I've only heard God speak audibly once in my life. And I'm going to say this, if it wasn't God, then I don't want to know who it was. And, and so I'll tell you what happened. I was in Bible college at the time. I worked in Tampa. We lived in Clearwater, and would, I would have to make the drive and, uh, back and forth every day. And I worked at a furniture store, and I was the, the cleaning guy of all things. I went through the whole store, dusted everything. This was a, a high-end furniture store, and, and it was a lot to keep up with. I hated the job. I had all of this stuff for, for school to keep up with. And, uh, and, and I had just gotten into this bad place. And so driving from Tampa to there is about a 45-minute drive. By the time I would get to work, you know, to, to work, I would just, I had exhausted myself in just whining to God. You know, God, I'm so tired of this. God, I can't do this. And this is just too much. And, you know, how can I go to school and not have to work and blah, 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 just kind of whining. And as I'm doing this, I'm about to pull into the parking lot, and I hear somebody say, stop it. And I was like, I mean, it got deathly quiet inside my truck at that moment. I mean, I'm not, for me, it was as audible as if you were to say something to me right now. To the point that I'm driving, I hear it, I shut up, I don't say anything, and I literally look over my shoulder to look in the back seat. Now, I didn't even have a back seat back then. It was just a two-door truck, okay? But, but somebody said it. Now, I will say this. I, uh, I'm glad that, you know, God's got manners. He didn't say, you know, just shut up. He said, stop it, is what he actually said to me. And, uh, and I was sharing that story with somebody else one time, and they said, that is weird. Uh, I was having a very similar experience, and, and that's exactly what I heard God say to me was, stop it. And, uh, and, I, and I walked away from those thinking, okay, God doesn't like whiners. So if you're a whiner, let me warn you now. Just stop it, okay, because God doesn't like it. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever heard God speak. Now, honestly, that's the only time, and I am as convinced as I can be that that, that was God or somebody sent by God to, to sit in the truck that day and tell me to, to stop doing that. But here's a question that I, I, that I ask, uh, and, and actually Jesus once said this, and, and I think this is uh, where we struggle the most with. Jesus said this one day to a group of followers. He said, my sheep listen. Everybody say listen. Another translation says, my sheep hears my voice. I know them, and he says, and they what? They follow me. My sheep, my followers know my voice. They listen to my voice, and they follow me. Do you know the voice of God? Can you distinguish his voice from all the other voices around us? Now, if we're honest, some voices are very unique. I mean, they're very recognizable. I, I, I was thinking, if I were to bring, have Stephanie to bring all the kids up and put them out there in the lobby right now while you as parents are sitting in here, and if one of those kids let out a, a scream that was louder than any other kid out there, one person would stand up immediately and run out of here, and that would be that kid's mother. You know why? Because they would know that voice from all the other voices out there. And, and you know what I'm saying. So, so we have this ability within us to, to distinguish voices. Now, there's a lot of voices that we're probably familiar with. I'm going to test you this morning just to see how good you are at recognizing some voices. So I'm going to play a couple sound clips, and, uh, and we'll stop in between each one, obviously, and we'll see if you recognize who that person is. So let's go ahead and fire up this first sound clip. about Bo was, from the time he, my, my, another expression my dad had was, never complain and never explain. All right, so everybody, most people knew who that is, our famous Joe Biden. 
And I, I promise not to make any comments about any of these things. So let's go on to the next voice and see if you recognize this There's something voice. going on. Look, there's something going on. Now, hopefully we don't have that problem with China. I always had a good relationship with China until the COVID came in. All right, who was that? Donald Trump, everybody knows that voice, don't we? All right, let's try the next one. I have found myself, I, I loved the sound so much that I found myself doing it sometimes when I laugh hard enough. You went. <laughs> How many of you know who that one is? Anybody? Ah, Taylor Swift right here in the middle. Very good. Any Taylor Swift fans in the audience today? Three of you. God bless you. Uh, we'll pray for you. I have to admit, as famous as she is, I did not recognize that one. All right, let's try another one. Let's keep going. Make it. Do the movie. Make it as dark as possible and yet have moments of humor in the face of that. Will it be accepted? I don't know. Robin Williams. I heard somebody saying that one before he even got done. So that was our Robin Williams, one of the best actors, I think, that have ever lived. All right, let's see how you do on this next he, he got me to a point where I believed him, and I said, you know, like a tiger had his arms like over me, and I'm feeding the tiger the bottle. And later I realized how stupid that was. Anybody? Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. Very good. All right, let's try another one. A different tone of voice. Uh, yeah, he was, he was authoritative, but he was just a gentle dad. Anybody recognize Mufasa? Or who else? Was Darth Vader? Yeah, so who was that? Anybody know who it was? James Earl Jones, some of you. All right, All right I got one more. Now, this one's going to be tough, so listen very carefully with this one. This will be the last one. Don't have to. I just want your heart. A father just wants your heart. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it was Jesus, or better known as, well, I don't know which he's better known as. It depends on which side of that you're on. So I was hoping some of you would recognize him as Jesus. Isn't it funny when you read your Bible, at least I do now after watching The Chosen so much, when I'm reading, especially the Gospels, the red letter parts, this is the voice that I hear reading that now. So it's crazy. So here's the deal. We've gotten and grown to a place where we can recognize people's voices, but can we and do we recognize God's voice? So there's a story in the Old Testament. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 3. I invite you to go ahead and turn there. And while you're turning there, I'll set it up just a little bit. Uh, Samuel was a famous prophet. Uh, last week, we actually read and, and Samuel was part of the conversation that we looked at last week. Samuel's the one who God chose to appoint Saul as king. And then we looked at a conversation uh, between Samuel and Saul last week as we talked about obedience. Well, Samuel wrote uh, first and second Samuel. And it's kind of interesting because in this, he tells a lot of stories about himself, but more about his stories and in interacting with other people. And so I want to pick up today the story in first Samuel. Uh, Samuel uh, Chapters 1 and 2 give us uh, his origin, uh, where he came from, how he ended up becoming the person that he did. A little background story there is uh, Samuel's uh, mother uh, was unable to conceive, and she wanted nothing more than to have her own son. And so she prayed and she prayed and she fasted and she fasted year after year after year and just begging God to give her a son. She even makes a deal with God and says, God, if you will just give me a son, I will give him back to you. I will dedicate him to you and he can serve you all of his life. Well, eventually, uh, God does answer her prayers. Uh, she does conceive. She gives birth to a son. She calls him Samuel, and she takes him to the temple, and she, she gives him over to the priest there and says, you know, this was the deal that I made with God. If he it would give me a son, that I would give him over, and he would serve God his entire life. And so she hands him over, and so Samuel grows up in the, the, in, in the temple. That's all he ever knew. And so I want to pick up the story in uh, chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1, and it says this. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. Eli was the, the head priest of that time, and so he was over the local uh, temple there. And so in those days, it says, the word of the Lord was rare. 
there were not many visions. In other words, uh, they were in a time of history where, where God didn't seem to be speaking a whole lot. People weren't getting a lot of visions, a lot of dreams, a lot of directions from God. Uh, God had revealed some things, and they were following those things, but there wasn't any new stuff coming from God. Verse 2 continues. It says, One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see. In other words, Eli was really getting up there in age. And uh, it says, He was lying down in his usual place. Verse 3 says, the lamp of God had not gone out yet. In other words, in the main sanctuary, the temple, there were some, some lamps that, that would burn up until they just ran out of oil that night, and they hadn't quite gotten to that point. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. And so this was the part of the temple was, that was like the most famous part, the most sacred part. Uh, it, it was the, for, for us, it would kind of be like this room right here that we're in right now. Uh, and, and, and so Samuel... For whatever reason, that's where he was laying down. He was resting at that moment and falling off to sleep. Verse 4 says this. Then the, then the Lord called to Samuel, and Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. And so Samuel goes back, and he lies down. Now you would think that of all people, Samuel would know the difference between somebody else's voice and Eli's voice because Eli's voice was the one that he knew and heard every single day. So he goes back and he lays down. He says, again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, again, here I am. You called me. My son, Eli, said, I did not call you. Again, go back and lay down. All right, this can ha continues to happen. Verse 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word, everybody say word. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now, he'd been serving. Chances, uh, he was probably a, a young teenager at this point. He'd been serving in the temple. Who knows what he'd been doing? Maybe he was a tech guy. Maybe he was the guy who just kept the lights burning. We don't really know up until that point what he was doing. Probably did a little bit of everything. But in all this doing that he was doing, working of all places in the temple, he had never heard. He, the, the word of God, the voice of God, had never been revealed to him. Verse 8. <clears throat> a third time, it says, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up, again went back to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Verse 9. Then Eli realized what was going on. Eli, being the, the head priest, realizes at this point, and he says, uh, Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. And so Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say this. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. To which Samuel then goes back. He lays down once again. And again, God's voice comes to him. Verse 10. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And this time, he's going to get an introduction to the voice of God. Here's what God says to him. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. Everybody say tingle. Now, we're going to stop here. I'm not going to tell you uh, what God, what the Lord tells Samuel. You can go back and read that this week. But what he's about to tell him, God says, this is going to make both ears of everyone who hears it tingle. Now, this wasn't a good tingle. I'm just going to, I, I will give that away. This was, the, the word that's used there is like this ringing, this hammering in their ears. It wasn't going to be good news, in other words. It was going to be bad news. Now, again, you can go back, you can read the story and kind of catch up on it. But I will say this. Uh, there was a shift in history at this moment. Up until this time, God had pretty much spoken uh, through some individuals that God would send, and we, we read them, and we, they were probably angels sent by God who looked like normal human beings. But other than that, God often spoke through the priest 
who were in charge of the temple, and, and, and they would speak on behalf of God. At this point in time, a shift begins to take place, and prophets become uh, very popular. In fact, Samuel becomes the first prophet. Uh, you know the story. He grows up and, and anoints uh, Saul, and Saul becomes king, and, and he's kind of his spiritual advisor. And, uh, and, and so there's a lot of history from there. Now, I want to stop there in the story because uh, what we need to get from that story is, is all there at this point. And so I'm going to give you four things. They're going to show up on the big screen here behind me. Four things that we, take, that we can take away from this story, and then we'll look at each one of them briefly. First of all, God could be speaking, and we could be missing it. God could be speaking, and we could be missing it. Number two, hearing God's voice is a learned thing. Number three, God speaks to different people in different ways. And then the fourth one, God will never speak against himself. God will never speak against himself. Now, we don't get that one from the story directly. If you read on in the story, you definitely will, and we'll cover that here in just a second. So let me break this down just a little bit. The first one is this. God could be speaking, and we could be missing it. I don't know about you, but but that's... All kinds of emotions get stirred up in me when I think about that. God could be speaking, and we could be missing it for a lot of different reasons. Maybe we've not trained ourselves to hear God's voice. Maybe we don't understand how God's voice uh, sounds or how God speaks to us. And, and so I, I was thinking of something that Jesus said early on in Matthew's account. He says, though seeing, they do not see Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. He continues, verse 15, he says, For these people's heart, or for this people's heart, has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. So this is Jesus speaking. And he's saying, I'm speaking, my Father is speaking, and yet people are missing it. And as a result of missing it, the things that I want to do in and through their lives, they're missing out on it. Now, there can be a lot of different reasons why we're not hearing God, but one of them is because we've just become hardened, we've become callous, or maybe we've just written it off and said, well, God doesn't speak to me, he speaks to other people. And we make excuses for why God may not be or we may not be hearing God speak. But there is a couple things, and and we're going to get to this toward the end of this, but notice he says they hardly hear with their ears, They hardly see with their eyes and their hearts. Okay, so we're going to see there there are different ways that God speaks to us. So just remember that from that verse. And the last thing I would say about this. You know, this should make, this, this point should make all of our ears tingle just a little bit. To think that God might be speaking and we might be missing it. Number two. Hearing God's voice is a learned thing. Just like Samuel, we have to learn to listen, and we have to learn to recognize God's voice in our life. Now, how do we do that? Well, Paul, writing to a group of believers, said this. He says, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the what? And he's talking about this right here. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The best way that you and I can learn to hear God's voice is to study this book right here. To be as familiar with this book as we possibly can. Because whenever God speaks, first and foremost, the the one way that God speaks to us is always through this book right here. This is the written word of God. Now it's interesting because I think Sometimes when we read it, we just kind of dismiss 
you know, what we're really reading. And we just think it's words on the pages. Or maybe you have one of those Bibles that in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's some red letters. And, and we, we've been taught that this is where Jesus speaks. And so when we read the red letter part, we pay it, you know, a little bit more attention because, okay, well, we know that part is God speaking. But the truth of the matter is, and, and that was a man-made thing, and, and, and it was cool that they did that, but that was not in the original scriptures that way. Listen, all of the scriptures were written, inspired by God. In fact, here's what 2 Timothy tells us. Paul writing to him says, all scripture is God-breathed. Everybody say God-breathed. In other words, it's God-inspired. God working through men wrote the holy scriptures that we have. And now, look what it says about them. All scriptures God breathed, and it's useful. Everybody say useful. For teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. If you want to hear God speak, the one sure way that I can promise you that he will speak to you is through this book right here. So if you want to hear him speak, make a habit of reading this every single day. Because I promise you that God will speak you. It's useful for teaching you, for rebuking you, for correcting you, for training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The better we know the Scriptures, the more familiar we are with them, the better the chance of us hearing God speak to us. But the Bible's not the only way that God speaks to us, which is number three on our list. God speaks to different people in different ways. God speaks to different people in different ways. In that verse, there was talking about people, you know, they, they, they hear with their ears, but they don't understand. They see with their eyes. They don't understand. They even have this heart thing going on, and they, they're still missing it. And so we see, even from that, we get this hint that, that God speaks to different people in different ways. Hebrews 1.3 says this, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. It was before they had any of this. Okay, even before, uh, they might have had, even after they got the first five books of the Bible, the, the Old Testament, uh, the, the Torah, uh, even after that, God would speak to them through that, but, but even they, like we, I think we dismiss it. And so they had these prophets who would speak on behalf of God, and, and, and God would speak to this prophet and say, here's what I want you to say to these people. And so he says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, uh, at many times and in various ways, again, various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. You and I live in a time that is, man, people prior to Jesus would have loved to have lived in. Because not only did, did that group of people in Jesus' day actually get to hear God speak verbally and straight to them, but now we have all of these teachings compiled for us in a book that, man, we have it at our fingertips at any time we want to read it and, and hear and see what Jesus said, we can have it. And through that, God speaks to us as well. Now, I just want to point out a couple things here under number three. I've made a little list that's going to show up, and the list is this. How does God speak to us today? Obviously, we've talked about it through the Scriptures. But do you realize that God often speaks to us through others as well? Right now, God could be speaking to you through me if you're listening, if you're paying attention. Not because I'm anybody special. I'm just sharing what God has put on my heart, and, 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 and maybe that, that was something that you needed to hear. Maybe it was from the songs that we sang earlier. Oftentimes, I hear people walk up to me after the service and go, man, I really needed that song. God just really spoke to me through that song this morning and the lyrics of that song. All right? and, and so God uses others. Through promptings, there are times where God will prompt you to do something. All right, maybe he'll put, uh, you know, we ask for uh, quite, uh, you to text back at Easter, we ask you to text in somebody's name that you would wanted us to pray with you for, that you would invite uh, to a service back at Christmas time. And, um, and, and sometimes I think that name that pops in our head is often a prompting from God. I have learned that when God puts a name on my heart, my mind, and especially if it's there for more than a day, 
I need to reach out to that person and call that person. I had somebody call me the other day. I hadn't heard from them in, in probably a couple years. And, uh, and when the phone rang and I saw who it was, I was shocked. And, and I answered it and I shared with them some things that were going on in my life around my dad and all. And that person said, okay, now I know why God put, me on, put you on my heart today and why I was supposed to call you. Those are promptings. We need to pay attention to them. Through circumstances, good and bad. Things that happen in our lives. And, and sometimes if something bad's going on, God's trying to say, listen, if you keep going down this path, it's only going to get worse. All right? So, so there are different ways that God speaks to us through different circumstances. And believe it or not, God speaks through dreams and visions. I don't think this is as common in our country as it is in some other countries. I often hear missionaries who, who share their stories about how they were praying to to witness to somebody, and they'll start having a conversation with somebody, and they'll stop them and say, okay, last night I had a dream that you were going to come up to me today and talk to me. And, and so their heart is already open to hear what this person has to say. And so I just say these, this is just a, 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 a sample of the different ways that God speaks to us in various ways, all right? And, and so we just need to learn to listen to pay attention, to be open to what God might be saying to us. Uh, my experience with hearing God, a couple, I'll just share a couple of examples with you. Uh, I hadn't been a, a follower of Christ, but for a couple of months, I've shared some of this story with you before, struggling. I, I was working at shipyard. There were two groups of believers there. A one who were really hung up on this idea that you got to earn your salvation, you got to be really good in order for God to forgive you and save you. And this other group who were like, no, it's not about what we do, it's all about grace. And I remember just being so confused. I would go home every day after listening to these people and I would join them for Bible study. And, and I, I finally I just said, God, I got to figure this out. I feel like I can't move on in my faith until I know the answer to that question. And I'd prayed that for months. We ended up at a conference. Uh, over in Norfolk one night, and a guy was speaking. I was sitting in the nosebleed section up on, in, the, uh, on the high side of that, and at the end of his message, his teaching that night, he did this illustration, and it was as if I were the only one sitting in that big scope coliseum that night. God spoke to me through that guy and answered my question, and out of that came my life verse, 1 John 5, 13, uh, that says that we are saved through grace. We're not saved through what we do. And, and that was a, a life-changing moment for me. I'll never forget that. God used somebody else to do it. Another time, we had, Lynette and I had felt like God were calling us into ministry. We didn't know what it looked like, what that meant, but we had surrendered to that and said, okay, God, we're here. Whatever you want to do, let us know. We were at a concert one night. A guy's playing. It was an incredible concert. And he walks out and he puts his guitar down and he says, I just feel this like I, I need to share something that God's put on my heart. And as he began to share it, I, it was one of those moments. It was like, okay, forget everybody else. I'm, this was for me. And I remember sitting there about three or four rows back, pretty centered like this, and I was just bawling because I realized that what he was sharing was a word from God for me. And God was giving me a glimpse as to, one, how long uh, it was going to take before I ended up in full-time Christian ministry and what I was going to have to experience uh, before I got to that. And, and, and it all came true. I, I, I you know, uh, just, again, ways that God speaks to us. One other way, um, we were looking for a new senior pastor here, and I was on the spiritual manager team. We were putting together uh, the qualifications, kind of what we were looking for. I had not at that point felt any desire to be a lead pastor of a church. I was comfortable being the second or third guy and doing what I was doing. But as we began to work through that, I really began to feel like God was saying, I want you to put your name in the hat for that position. And I wrestled with it. And, and I remember Lynette and I came up. We were kind of prayer walking and walking uh, through the end of the property down here. And I said to Lynette, I said, I said, I don't get it, but I think God is telling me I need to put my name in the hat for this. And she looked at me and she said, I know that you do. And I'm like, what do you mean you know that you do? She goes, I've known it for a long time. And I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me that? And she said, you needed to hear it from God first. And so God used that to her to confirm that prompting 
within me. And, and so again, I just share some of that to, to say this is often how God works and we just need to be open and paying attention to that. Let me give you one more list. And uh, it's something that, that, uh, that I've never been able to articulate as well as I can now. And I recently picked up a book called Created to Hear God. Again, one of these things. We're in a bookstore a couple of weeks ago. I went to buy a different book. I bought that book. I saw this book on the shelf, and I felt like I was supposed to buy that book, but I left and didn't buy it. And for the next couple of days, it just drove me nuts to the point that I said, all right, I got to go back and get that book. And I know why, because it tied in so much to what we were talking about today. In this book, uh, she talks about different ways that we're wired to hear from God. I love, she said, the, the title of the book is Created to Hear God. And, uh, but she said they're hearers, they're seers, they're feelers, and they're knowers. And, and obviously, I don't have the time to go through all of this this morning but here's are those people who, are, who often say, I got a word from God today. You know, or I got a word from God for you. And so they, they often have a phrase, they often have a word, or, or there'll be people like, you know, I got a word from God today, this is my word for the year. And God uses that word throughout the year to minister to them or to minister through them to other people. Uh, but but there, there are people who have this innate way of hearing God speak in their lives. I don't think it's not audible. And in fact, most of the time it's not audible, but it's through scripture. It's through what something they're reading. And they just know that that was a word from God. Seers are people who have the ability to see things. They see the big picture. These are your visionaries, your, your dreamers. Uh, and in fact, uh, as you read more into Samuel's story, Samuel is called not just a prophet, but he is referred to as a seer. Uh, he had this in, uh, ability to, to see the big picture, to see beyond what most people could see, and, and, and just had a sense of God in it. The third one are feelers. Uh, these are people who are, are more emotionally connected with God. They can walk into a room and just go, wow, something's not right, or wow, God is presence is just overwhelmingly in this place today. Now, we, if you're like me, I've had a tendency to kind of be leery of some of these, these people. But this really helped me put into practice or, or put in, be able to articulate some of this. The fourth one is knowers. And, uh, and when, when I read this, I was like, well, this is me. And my wife will tell you, this, this, this is definitely me. I never quite understood it, couldn't articulate it now the way that I can. But knowers have this ability to kind of, one, push through things. Uh, they, just, they just know that, okay, whatever we're going through is temporary. There's something on the other side of it. They have a strong sense of discernment, uh, meaning that, that I, I have this ability to sometimes just sense what maybe something's not right, you know, and begin to pray toward that way or, or realize that there, there's something going on in that person's life. And, and, and so we, we just have this way of knowing it. And, and oftentimes it's like, okay, that was a God thing. And so I just share that because I, I want you to understand this, this is, you know, and I highly recommend this book if you, if you want to dig a little bit more into this because all of us fill in, fall into that. But I will say this, uh, even out of that, God has spoken to me in, in probably every one of those ways at different times. But knowing by far is the biggest way that God in my life has spoken to me over the years. And so God can and will speak in all sorts of ways. He's not limited to speak to one way, and neither are we in hearing just one way from God. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, last one. Let's go back to, to our main list. The fourth on the list was God will never speak against himself. And I feel very, I, I need to make sure that I cover this and people hear this. Because God's character is perfect, the things that he speaks, he will never speak against what he's already spoken. He'll never go against himself. He'll never go against his character. He will never go against what is written in this book. I don't believe that there are new revelations, that we should add chapters to this book. So when somebody says, hey, you know, God gave me this vision and, 
And now I know the rest of the story. And I'm like, no, we already know the rest of the story. So we just got to be careful around that. I think when it comes to the scriptures, there's one interpretation of the scriptures, but there are many applications to, the, the, to that interpretation. Just like we're, re, we're looking at the story of Saul and, and his experience in the temple. And, and so the, you know, the, the interpretation is this is exactly what happened, but here's what we can learn from that experience. Does that make, help you make sense on that as far as applications? Uh, Samuel himself said this, 1 Samuel 15, 29. He says, he who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. And, and, and so Samuel's just speaking into this, that, that God is who he is. And he's not about new revelations and new things and all, you know, every single day, and some, but, but he will always be true to himself, and he'll always be true to you and me. So let me wrap this up. What do we do with all this? Question, do you believe you were created to hear from God? If I ask you, did you do you want to hear from God, I bet every single one of you would say, yeah. But do you believe that you were created to hear from God? Because you were. You were. And so I wanted to offer you a simple prayer that you can begin to pray that will help you hear from God. And it was the advice that Eli gave Samuel. He said, Samuel, the next time you're wondering who that is, he says, just say this, Lord, speak because your servant is listening. And maybe just say, God, help me to hear, help me to see, help me to feel, help me to know your voice. And guys, as we close today, remember, you have one thing to do today. What is it? Follow him. I have only one thing to do today. Follow him. The rest takes care of itself. Follow him because the rest takes care of itself. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me for a moment. And uh, I'm going to ask Trey to come out and close us in prayer. Um, I want to say thank you on behalf of my family, my dad's wife, Valerie, which many of you know, um, for your prayers, for your support. Over these last couple of weeks especially, um, my dad went home to be with the Lord Friday morning. And um, he was at peace. It was a very peaceful moment. And, uh, but I just want to say thank you for, your, for, for being our family during this time. Uh, we will be planning a celebration of life service. Uh, we've not gotten that far into this yet, but... Um, but watch social media, watch some of our pages. Many of y'all follow my family and different members of us, and uh, we'll be letting you know when that is. But again, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for your support. And I'm going to ask Trey if he would close us in prayer. Okay. And thank you guys for the support you've shown Jeff and his family. And like I said, we will be announcing the Celebration of Life service, but continue to be praying for them. And I love the first song that we sang, Deliverer. And it talked about how God will always see us through. And I know, I know you'll miss your dad here on this earth, but I know that, that God will get you guys through this as you grieve the loss of somebody that we all cared and loved so much for. So as we close today, let's remember Jeff and his family, and let's also ask God to continue to help us all hear his voice as we leave here today. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for being the amazing God that you are, God, thank you for caring for us, for loving us, for giving us peace in times of confusion and hardship. And God, giving us joy even in times of sorrow. 
And so, Lord, today I just pray for each and every one of us. As we leave here today, may we learn to uh, discern your voice better in our lives. Thank you for the words that Jeff shared with us. May they be encouragement to our lives and souls today. And, God, we do. We lift up Jeff, his family, and Valerie to you today. God, we thank you for the incredible man Claude was and how he uh, touched all of our lives, Lord. And we just pray that you continue to be with them. Give them your peace and comfort during this time, God, as they just continue to walk through the days ahead. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.